All right, we're going to talk about hell. <laughs> Seriously, I've been excited about this for all week. One of the children at the 8 o'clock service said to her mother while we were talking about hell, while I was talking about hell, he sure does cuss a lot. So, because <laughs> I was using the word hell. You can say hell in church. We're going to talk about hell. No, this is going to be fun. The reason I want to talk about hell is because it comes up several times in the gospel today. It's on Jesus' lips. Now, did y'all notice that I, that I changed a word? Anybody notice that? Okay. I used Gehenna one time and hell twice. File that away. We'll get back to that. Now, the reason I'm excited about talking about hell this morning is because Christians, our people, us, maybe not you, I'm sure you're the pious, educated bunch, but me and the rest of Christianity for generations have had a misguided focus on and fear of hell. And it's been going on for too long. It's been going on for darn near 2,000 years, and I would like to end it today. You down for that? We're going to straighten out our understanding about hell, and we're going to start by talking about love. That shocks you, I know. No, Jesus' whole program, his whole program, is about love. Love of God and love of neighbor. People said to Jesus, hey, what's the big deal? Like, what are the biggest deals in the tradition? And what did he say? Well, love God with all that you are. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. Everything else is built on that, on love. And our tradition over the generations has said that the goal of all of this is union, like union, oneness with God and love. So Jesus is always trying to get us to follow him. Remember Jesus' two favorite words? Follow me, follow me, follow me. He's always trying to get us to follow him into the groove of love. Can you imagine a groove? Like a groove in the land or in a piece of wood or maybe even a groove in your own mind, like a neural groove? A groove. Maybe a groove is like a river current, like you get in it and you're carried along. The groove of love is what Jesus is always calling us to follow him into. Now, the hard part about the groove of love is staying in it. You follow? You ever get kicked out of the groove? Any human beings in the room with me this morning? Amen. Bob and I, yeah. Get kicked out of the groove, right? All manner of things can cause us to stumble, that's the word Jesus uses in the gospel, to stumble out of the groove of love. Now stay with me here. Jesus calls the place, the place that we land when we stumble out of love's groove, hell. Actually, he doesn't call it hell. He calls it Gehenna. Gehenna, this is going to be a little Sunday schoolish. Gehenna is an Aramaic word, which was the language Jesus spoke. It's translated into Greek, which was the language the New Testament was written in, and it stays sort of Gehenna. And then we translate that word Gehenna into English. What do you think it is? Hell. Do you follow? Are we together so far? Now here's where it really gets, gets fun. It's kind of like we're solving a Rubik's Cube here. Gehenna, translated in English, hell. God, those people at your church cuss a lot, don't they? No, Gehenna, translated into English, hell, is a literal geographical place. You can go there today. We could all buy plane tickets, fly to Jerusalem, and I could take you to hell, to Gehenna. It's a valley, Gehenna Valley, is outside the city walls of Jerusalem, literally. So you remember maybe that Jerusalem is a city on a hill, literally. It's got a wall around it, literally. And on one side of this city on a hill is a valley called the Kidron Valley, literally. And like pull up a map on your phone and you'll see Kidron Valley. And on the other side of the city on a hill called Jerusalem is a deep, deep valley called Gehenna Valley. Now, in Jesus' day, so some 2,000-odd years ago, Gehenna Valley, the literal place, was not a fun place. 
It was not a place you take your family on a picnic. Now, according to, to scholars and archaeologists have a number of different things that they say was going on at Gehenna Valley 2,000 years ago that made it not a great picnic place. Among them are, many say that it was a garbage dump. So city landfill, right? Sound fun? And in this garbage dump in Gehenna Valley, way down in the depths of it, uh, the trash was set on fire, so, which is not uncommon if you think about it. It's not, that's not uncommon. Um, so it was a smoldering, smelly, smoky place, like burning trash. Does that sound like a place you want to have a picnic? Others say that it was, um, in addition to being a, a dumping ground, it was a burial ground where cremations took place. Now, largely today, we don't see cremations taking place. They take place. We just don't see them, right? They're, we, a lot of us probably don't even know where they're taking place. We don't know where the crematory is, mostly. But can you imagine if it was just right outside the church here, in a little dip in the road? Like in a valley, there were cremations? Again, not a fun place. Finally, legend has it that a few generations before Jesus came along, there were human sacrifices. Huh? Huh? And this is in the Old Testament stories. There were human sacrifices taking place in Gehenna Valley. Have I painted the picture? Huh? I don't know. Whatever the case may be, you get the picture. It was a miserable place. So Jesus says, to stumble out of the groove of love, which is what the whole point of life is, is to be in the groove of love. To stumble out of the groove of love is like, is like you ever search for a metaphor or a symbol while you're telling a story or giving a teaching? Do you, you know what I'm talking about? He says it's like, it's like, it's like, and then do, do you ever have the experience of it suddenly comes to you? Do you know what I'm talking about, Bob? It suddenly comes to you. Oh, perfect image. It's like living down in Gehenna Valley. And everybody says, oh, God, not there. Oh, got it. Point made. I mean, who wants to live at the landfill where folks say murders used to take place? Anyone? Picnic there today? You good? Me too. You see the point I'm making? Hmm? Ah. Jesus wasn't talking about y'all. Come on, come on. He wasn't talking about eternal punishment. Huh? That would be antithetical to the infinite compassion and love of God, wouldn't it? Eternal punishment? The total opposite of the eternal love of God. The collect of the day is the opening prayer we use in this worship service. Did y'all catch the first sentence of it? It says, you, O oh God, show your power chiefly by showing mercy. So Jesus is talking, when he talks about Gehenna and hell, he's talking about mis being miserable and cut off, not for eternity after you die, but in the present tense, today. And the people said, amen, I know about that. Hmm? But we misunderstood. Then in Georgia we say, bless our hearts. Well, no, we misunderstood. Huh? Our people, and a lot of us, we misunderstood. And here we go, bless our hearts. We ended up building an entire wing of our religion. Oh, Lord. On a misunderstanding. Somebody said, give me a contemporary example. Okay, it reminds me of the Will Ferrell movie, Talladega Nights. Now, I do not recommend you seeing this movie. No, no, no. It's crass. It is crude. It is totally inappropriate. It is not the kind of film that your priest should tell you to see. So I do not, Emory, make sure the recorder's on. I do not recommend you seeing the movie Talladega Nights. But I've seen it. <laughs> and the main character in the movie Talladega Nights is a man named Ricky Bobby. And Ricky Bobby is a race car driver. Hmm? He's an adult and he's a race car driver, like NASCAR race car driver, and he's massively successful. When he was a little boy, his wayward father, who was a miscreant, just drunk, just awful dude, said something to Ricky that he built his entire life on. It was career day at Ricky's school, elementary school, and his dad shows up smoking a cigarette the whole bit, and he does career day for, for Ricky Bobby's school, and he's an amateur race car driver. And he says to Ricky and his classmates, here's what I want you to remember for all of your lives. If you're not first, you're last. If you're not first, you're last. There ain't no in-between. If you're not first, you're last. Very black and white, right? 
His father then, Ricky Bobby's father of this story in this film, then disappears for the rest of Ricky's childhood. So, so for three decades maybe, he's gone. And along the way, Ricky, if you're not first, you're last, becomes a famous race car driver who, if you're not first, you're last, is very, very successful. Until he's not. He always wins until he doesn't. And when he doesn't win, his life falls apart. Because if you're not first, you're what? Last. At the end of the film, there's this funny, silly scene between Ricky Bobby, now the adult, famous race car driver, and his father. And his father is up to his old ways. He gets them kicked out of an Applebee's, and they're standing out in the middle of the street. And his father is about to walk off into the sunset yet again, yet again walking away from Ricky Bobby. And Ricky Bobby shouts back to him. They're standing in the middle of this busy uh, traffic-drenched street. And Ricky Bobby shouts to his dad, Hey, Dad, always remember, if you're not first, you're last. And his dad turns around and look, y'all, y'all see, he turns around and looks at him. And he says, What? What did you say? And Ricky Bobby says, If you're not first, you're last. He's like a 45 year old man, but he's got that childhood lesson stuck in him. So he's like an eight year old. He says, If you're not first, you're last. Well, that's what you told me. If you ain't first, you're last. And Ricky Bobby's dad says, Son, I was high when I said that. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all. First, you're last? Well, you could be second, you could be third, you could be fourth. Hell, you could even be fifth. And Ricky Bobby says back to him, what are you talking about? Well, I lived my whole life based on that. I've lived my whole life based on that. If you're not first, you're last. Now what am I supposed to do? His dad looks at him and he kind of gets a little quiet and he says, well, now that's the million dollar question. What are you supposed to do? If it's not about eternal damnation, what are we supposed to do? Now, Jesus wasn't high, you see, but he was using hyperbolic speech. Did you catch that? Exaggerated speech. He doesn't actually mean that when we stumble in life, we are risking eternal punishment. That doesn't even make any sense. No gray area at all? If that were true, now check me out on this, if that were true, we'd have to ignore most of the other teachings of Jesus. If it were true that it's possible that God will punish us forever, torturing us forever in fire, this hell that Dante largely invented, we'd have to ignore most of the other teachings of Jesus. I guess we'd have to totally dismiss the parable of the prodigal son. I think we'd have to do away with all of the healing scenes. We'd have to do away with most of the Sermon on the Mount. I've I've added it up. We'd have to do away with 75% of the teachings of Paul. You could no longer have at your wedding that whole love never ends piece from 1 Corinthians. I'm not sure, frankly, what we'd do. Huh? With my favorite, that piece of, what is it, 1 John? God is love. Huh? God is love, but he might burn me forever. Hmm. I imagine, I imagine a conversation out in the street with Jesus. Huh? Now I imagine it, you know. Hey, Jesus, I said, remember you told us that if we're not good, we're going to go to hell and burn and be tortured forever by God. Jesus turns and looks at me and he says, what? What did you just say? I said, yeah, Gehenna, hell, we'll be tortured forever if we're not good by by God. And Jesus said, well, Andrew, that doesn't even make any sense. Gehenna, I thought you went to seminary. Gehenna is a valley, like a real place outside of Jerusalem. Look at a map, man. (laughs) I was using a metaphor, I imagine Jesus saying. I was using a metaphor to make a point. See, the real downside to understanding hell as a place where where you might go when you die is that it causes us to miss the power of the metaphor, the actual intent in Jesus' teaching about Gehenna Valley, which is this, that hell is a place we can go today. It's a place that I do take picnics in. Huh? 
and a place that we can camp out and stay for years. Anybody ever had a resentment? Huh? Anybody ever had a resentment that smolders and burns inside of you for years? Like, how long do you want to keep that up? That's hell. How long? <laughs> you good Christians probably don't watch the news, but every now and then I turn it on. Huh? How long do we want a refusal to walk in our neighbor's shoes to keep the fires of the culture wars burning? Huh? How long do we want to fight like this? Like, God Almighty. Huh? That's hell. And we are stuck there. How long do we want our attachment to material things to keep us from realizing the point of life, which is a love-soaked union with God? How long do we plan on keeping up the illusion that upgrades, upgrades, I've done them all, baby, upgrades to our homes, our automobiles, our bodies, our reputations will satisfy the hunger that rumbles inside of us? When we're chasing after, the, am I the only human being in this room? When we're chasing after those things, baby, that is hell, and I can stay there. At what point, says Jesus, do y'all want to ask for help, Hendry, in climbing out of the valley of hell so you can slip back into the groove of love? Cut your hand off if that's what it takes. Again, it's a metaphor. He's saying take drastic action. Now, here's the good news. You want to hear the good news? Huh? Somebody said, yeah, tell me the good news. The good news is that there is no place that God is not. No, God is infinite love or God is not God at all, and we ought to pack this thing up and go home. Huh? No, no, no. If God is not infinitely present everywhere, and the presence of God is not infinite love everywhere, then this ain't real, and we ought to go home. But we believe that it is. So the good news is that there is no place that God is not, even hell. Even hell. Now we're going to close on this. A number of years ago, I went to Jerusalem. Some of you have been to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem. And I hiked with my friends down into Gehenna Valley. We, went down, we walked down into hell voluntarily. And I want to tell you this. Hell, Gehenna Valley, the literal place, is an absolutely beautiful place today. I'm from Georgia. It reminds me, literally, it reminds me of a hole at, an, at Augusta National Golf Course. It's landscaped, it's manicured, it is just gorgeous. And the thing that really struck me when I was there is that there are beautiful blooming flowers everywhere. Flowers blooming in hell. And we walked down the valley, my friends and I that day, to the bottom of it, huh? and looking around. And as I remember, I said at the beginning of this, Gehenna Valley is this, this deep valley below the hill city of Jerusalem. So we walked down into the bottom of that thing, and then I looked back up, way up there at the walled-in city of Jerusalem. And after a few minutes of just hanging out down there, I noticed, I looked down, I noticed we were standing, this is true, in what looked like ashes. Ashes. And then I realized that we were standing in an old fire ring. Come on. In the bottom of hell? Here we were in hell, and we'd stumbled onto the remnants of a fire from the past. Good boy scout that I am, I bent down and touched the ashes. They were cold. Fire had long since gone out. And I stood back up, standing there in that old fire, and I looked back up towards Jerusalem. You're not going to believe this, but it's true. At the exact moment that I looked back up, A door opened in the bottom of the city wall. And a man walked out, y'all, holding a bag of trash, which he unceremoniously threw down the hill into Gehenna Valley. And it was the wildest thing. Oh, it was the wildest thing. A perfect convergence of symbols and metaphor playing out in real life. Someone was throwing trash into a beautiful place right before our eyes. That is hell. And in your own way, like explode that metaphor. And in your own way, think of where hell is in your life today. Where are you or somebody around you or both throwing trash into beauty? That is hell. The trash of hatred, the trash of selfishness, the trash of racism, the trash of materialism, the trash of always needing to be right, the trash of this unquenchable thirst for power. 
all of the trash strewn about in this beautiful creation, in this beautiful community of people. It's hell, so hell is real. Hell is real, and we stumble, when we stumble out of the groove of love, we end up there. But hell is not forever. If you only remember two things from this sermon, other than, boy, I thought that went kind of long, remember this. (laughs) Hell is real, and hell is not forever. Hell is real, and hell is not forever. Hell is not forever because the infinity of God's love has permeated every corner of creation, even the the depths of Gehenna Valley. And the good news is that we can climb out of hell any time because there is nowhere that God is not. And what's really awesome is that we will find as we emerge, hike up out of that valley, that Jesus is walking with us because there's nowhere that God is not. Sometimes when I'm down in the valley, Jesus talks to me. He says, how long do you think we're going to stay down here? I mean, I'm down for it because I'm Jesus and I, I'm everywhere. But do you, do, are, we, are we another day down here in hell? No, Jesus, let's hike out. You ever say that to God? No, Jesus, let's hike out. See, here's the deal. We've got to grow up, don't we? I mean, not y'all, but me and the rest of humanity. We've got to grow up and grow out of this strict black and white rewards punishment system that our culture has lived in for far too long. It's time to emerge into something new. Because the deal is this, there are flowers blooming in hell today. May they bloom in our hearts as well today. Amen.